Hello and welcome back to California Geology. I'm Dr. Robert Lopez and today I want to talk about the origin of the batholith. Your, your book has a whole section on um, how these uh, batholiths form and they really form at an ocean to continent convergent boundary and remember we call that a magmatic arc, magmatic arc, where there's a subduction zone. And then where you see that hydrous flux melting, where that oceanic lithosphere, that's hydrated. Remember, that ocean lithosphere was hydrated at a mid-oceanic ridge through that hydrothermal circulation. And the, the dewatering, or the hydrous flux melting, um, that water leaks out of that downgoing slab. It's really more like 100 kilometers, not really 150, but it's more like 100 kilometers depth in the subduction zone. Remember that Benioff zone? The earthquakes that are around 150 or 100 kilometers, that's where we're seeing the magmas rise and we see the volcanoes above that. So that must be the zone of, of melting in the mantle wedge above that downgoing ocean lithosphere. So again, the key thing is at about 100 kilometers depth, we're seeing melting in the mantle wedge, the region of the mantle just above that, that subducting ocean lithosphere. And the water lowers the melting point of the mantle. Um, produces mafic magmas, and then those magmas ascend into the crust, and they'll um, maybe do that, uh, that crystal fractionation, where there's crystal settling, where you're removing the mafic components into those mafic cumulates I talked about, those mafic gneisses of the southern Sierra Nevada, and then the residual magma becomes uh, less mafic and more felsic, eventually forming the tonalites, the, the quartz monzonites, the granodiorites, and in some cases you get even form all the way up to granite. Now, uh, here's another sketch of an ocean to continent convergent boundary. Note that about 100 kilometers is where we're seeing the, 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 the hydrous flux melting in the mantle wedge up in here. Those ascending magmas are mafic, and they could experience fractionation here to produce a more felsic batholith. And you, would, you will see the volcanoes as well, the magmatic arc here. And those are like the Ritter range uh, that we see, um, remember 100 million year old volcanoes there. Now, um, here's a little cartoon, yeah, there it's funny. It's showing, um, from, remember the oldest is about maybe 215, here it goes from 220 to about 60 million years. Uh, so remember the Sierra Nevada, we got about 215 to about 80 million years are the bulk of the granites. But we're seeing what's happening to um, the, the magmatism over time. And what I want you to get out of this picture is that it's moving eastward, moving eastward, right? It's, it's farther west in the Triassic. As you go through the Jurassic and Cretaceous, it goes eastward, right? So something must be happening to the subduction angle, right? Uh, in fact, we'll come back to this here. So something must be happening to the subduction angle. So um, again, this work is done by Otmar Tobish, 1995. So what we're seeing is as um, subduction is going on, remember, uh, depends on the angle. It'll reach the 100 kilometer depth at one point. So if the angle is shallow, um, or steeper that is, uh, you'll reach that 100 kilometers more quickly and the volcanoes will be closer to the trench, right? So the, the arc trench gap will be narrower when you have a steeper subduction. For example, off of the um, uh, some of the islands in the South Pacific, um, the Tonga Trench, for example, um, just north of New Zealand, that subduction zone is almost at 90 degrees. And so we find the volcanoes right uh, almost above the trench because the, the subduction angle is so steep. But in this case, it's shallow, and we're seeing the, uh, a gap here, the arc trench gap. So what's happening is over time, the, the subduction angle gets even shallower, where now we're reaching the 100 kilometers a little farther east, right? And so now the volcanoes have to move farther east. And then by about 90 million years, we're seeing a very shallow subduction. And again, we're seeing the eastward migration of the arc. So again, that migration depends on the subduction zone angle and when that downgoing slab reaches that 100 kilometer depth. This is the map taken for your book, uh, uh, figure 8-18, and it shows that over time, the ages of the plutons get younger. They get younger over time, indicating, again, this migration of, of, of plutonism, of magmatism, eastward over time, right? indicating this shallowing of the subduction zone angle. 
Now let's look at some in, some uh, some features of the granite. And one of them that's quite common are these columnar joints or cooling joints. So remember the magma, it's molten. It, 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 has, it occupies a larger volume, but when it solidifies, it contracts. And it contracts under these systematic fractures called joints. In fact, the definition of a joint is a fracture in rocks where no slip occurs, right? So if there were slip, then we call that a fault, but there's no slip. So this is a joint. And, it, and joints come in a variety of forms. There's either uh, cooling joints like these. Sometimes there's pressure release ones, and we'll talk about those here in a second. Um, but anyways, in this picture here, we can see this prominent fractures here, these joints. There's a set that's, horizontal, that's vertical here, and one that's nearly horizontal going through here. So that's one conspicuous feature of, uh, of jointing. Another um, one is, um, this, it's, it's really called sheeting joints. A sheet joint or sheeting uh, results from uh, the, the release of overburdened pressure. So remember these, these plutonic rocks, these, this baffle was once buried anywhere from 10 to 50 kilometers. So it was under enormous pressure. But now it's exposed to the surface. It's exposed up here, and, there, and the rock literally stretches out, right? It kind of stretches out. This is the Royal Arches here in Yosemite, half dome. And really, this, this structure forms because of this exfoliation or stretching out where the, where the rock uh, is no longer is under burial pressure, that lithostatic uh, stress. Now it can stretch out and will form these dome-shaped structures. So half dome, north dome over here, uh, clouds rest back over here. Uh, so these are not due to glaciers. They're due to the, the unroofing of the batholith and the exposure of the batholith at the surface. And you see this, this overburdened pressure release. Here's a little, um, another view of, of uh, in fact, this is the Little Yosemite Valley. And we're seeing um, uh, um, uh, uh, Liberty Cap, this is Liberty Cap right here. So if you're hiking up to um, uh, Half Dome, you'd go up the, the Mist Trail here. This is Vernal Falls. Make your way over here, climb up this trail over Nevada Falls, go around Liberty Cap here, and make your way up to, toward Half Dome, toward the left there. Um, in fact, uh, Liberty Cap is an exfoliated dome, but both Nevada Falls and Vernal Falls are actually due to, to the master jointing, right? In fact, we call it the giant stairway here. Because see, remember the master joints. Here we have a series of nearly horizontal joint sets and some that are not quite vertical, but they're at a steep angle. And so where they intersect, uh, when the glaciers came down here, you can see the U-shaped wide valley. So there was a glacier coming down here. And the glacier probably plucked away the rock that was here, plucked it away and left uh, a step. And today, now that the glacier is gone, the rivers flow here and these become the falls. So um, the Nevada Falls and Vernon Falls are really due to the master joint sets. Let's go back and look at that one picture here. So here is a nearly vertical one and a horizontal one, right? So that's what we're seeing in the Little Yosemite Valley. And then here is a, a, another diagram showing how we can form the exfoliated domes, right? So remember, uh, the pluton was originally buried. It's under lithostatic pressure. Now we're going to erode that rock away, so it's going to start stretching and relaxing and making these um, exfoliated domes. Uh, one of the ramifications of this is now we have these big slabs of rock sitting up here. And note that the slope of these of, of this exfoliated jointing is parallel to the to the slope of the of the mountain here, and so with earthquakes or or just over time with with weathering, these big slabs will fall as as giant slabs of rock rock falls, and and you'll have this um, uh, feature going on here. In fact, that's something that's been happening in Yosemite for all of its history. These rock falls. We'll say more about that. When we actually do glaciers and, and, um, and rock falls in Yosemite. Now, um, the last, uh, well, actually, there's one more picture here. This is actually Olmsted Point on the Tioga Pass Road, so very good exfoliation here, yeah, nice exfoliation. And you can see the exfoliation up here on, on Half Dome, right? In fact, if you ever climb Half Dome, you have to go up these, these uh, um, uh, cables to get to the top here. But Half Dome is exfoliated as well as well. And then uh, the last feature 
that I want to mention here is uh, Schlieren, right? So the three features were the the um, the the cooling joints, the exfoliation, and now the Schlieren. And Schlieren are kind of unusual. They're they're streaks of mafic minerals, uh, and they usually occur near the margins of the pluton. Uh, they they and they may indicate flow within the pluton. So as a pluton is moving up through the crust, uh, they're squeezing through fissures or fault cracks, and 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 these these are kind of streaks of these mafic minerals that may form along the margins of this um, of these plut of these uh, magma chambers, these plutons. And so the Schlieren uh, uh, um, also are, are give you clues as to the age relationship because uh, you can tell which pluton is older because younger younger plutons will have their Schlieren cut across them. So we use that principle of cross-cutting relations. So anyhow, those are some features we see in the in the Sierra granitic rocks. All right, well, let's stop here for now.